He's in Fate's hands now. Do you know the way? Yeah. Following the river should get us back to the village. We're not going to the village. Can you get us to the reactor? Sorry, I... I don't think I can. I see. Well, we certainly can't send you back alone. You'll be safer with us. Okay. I'll be joining you up front this time. What? For your performance review. You kidding me? Good luck. Something like this did in fact happen in the original game where the bridge collapsed as we were attempting to cross it, but it wasn't quite so dramatic as a lightning strike and then everybody falling into a river. But it does show something, like they had to expand on a number of things in these remake games in order to, to flush it out and stuff. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and give it crap for not being identical to the original. But it has shown a little something like Sephiroth was not just out to kill everybody. In the original game, during the Nibelheim flashback sequence, he did come across just as a little bit cold. I mean, he, he wasn't like devoid of personality. He just didn't seem to... Um, he didn't interact with that many people. And uh, there weren't really that many opportunities to even like engage with him in a conversation. In this, though, you're spending quite a bit more time with him. And you do see some stuff like when, after they fell, I mean, for one thing, like that way that they play the animations out, he's hanging on that and he sees it about to collapse. So he just sort of lets go. He's like, well, okay, I guess I got to go and fall. So he just lets go. And everyone else just sort of gets blown off of the, or slips off of the rope. He lands and doesn't have any trouble standing in the flowing river. Whereas Cloud or Zack, I suppose, goes and, um, struggles a bit before he manages to find his footing, and Tifa can't do it. She's just not able to, not able to find her footing, and she starts slipping down the river. And it's actually Sephiroth that saves her life. Cloud saves the life of one of the troopers, which I guess is the actual Cloud, and another one dies, disappears. Now that happened in the original. One of the troopers just didn't make it back, but they added a the little detail. Sephiroth is willing to do things for other people. He's not a monster yet. He actually saves Tifa's life. A Mako Spring. It's beautiful. <sighs> yeah, but if we keep using Mako to power our homes, springs like this will disappear, right? What are you talking about? Who told you that? My dad. And the mayor, if you must know. Except the planet's huge. Mako will never run out, right? Naturally formed materia. And look at the size of it. Astounding. For the Mako energy to condense into something like this, it must have taken an eternity. I've always wondered. How does Materia let you cast spells exactly? <laughs> How did you ever get to be a soldier? Hmm. To put it simply, the knowledge of the ancients is sealed within each orb. That knowledge not only connects us to the planet, it allows us to tap into her power. That's how we can use magic. Or so they say. Really? Magic sure is weird. <laughs> I know someone who'd be livid to hear you call it weird, or magic for that matter. I can just imagine what he'd say. It's an affront to science. Who? Hojo 
from research and development. His predecessor was a great man, but him... He is anything but... We should press on. Again, expanding upon the things that they had said in the original game, the original game was riddled with odd grammar and perhaps translation issues. In the original conversation, in the original game, that conversation was much shorter, and it was just like, oh, how come we can use magic? And he just gives, and Sephiroth gives this little, I think he laughs even, gives this little um, remark about how Hojo would have been so upset if he had heard you use the word magic, and they expanded that out. So they just little, the same conversation, just little bits of detail that they put in there. But something I want to point out, though, are these little, these little nods that they put. I'd mentioned in previous episodes about how the play person playing the game is perhaps going to know that we're looking at a story being told by an unreliable narrator. Cloud is telling the story of how he went to Nibelheim with Sephiroth and he ventured to the reactor with Tifa and all that kind of stuff. And this is not quite how it all happened. He's imagining himself, and not intentionally, but he has deluded himself into believing that he was the soldier that we're playing as right now, whereas this was actually Zack and Cloud was just the trooper that's following them around. Hiding his identity because he's ashamed of himself. So all the interactions that we're seeing here, all the interactions that we're seeing between Cloud and Sephiroth is actually Zack and Sephiroth. And the interactions between Cloud and Tifa is actually Zack and Tifa. So they're putting in these little subtle animations in, especially with Tifa, which sort of give that idea away. Now, it's it's fairly subtle. I mean, her... Uh, she gets startled a few times by his sort of over-the-top actions. Saw in an earlier episode when he... Like, he just... He walks up to her, and then she sort of, like, she steps back. And then he starts doing this weird little squatting routine, and then she gets, like, surprised by that. And in that animation we just saw, where they're talking about the Mako Spring, he, he, she says something, a sort of, um, she says something about a kind of environmentalist message where the Mako, Mako Fountain is going to dry up because of the reactor. Sorry, I'm still coming down off of a COVID infection. <laughs> um, where was I? Um. She says that the fountain is going to dry up because of the reactors sucking the Mako out, and there just won't these natural springs won't occur anymore. And Cloud or Zack, as it would be, is like immediately like dismisses her and says like uh, spits out a company line from Shinra, something that I suspect Cloud wouldn't have done even if he had believed that what he was saying to be true, just wouldn't of confronted her like that and um, he's like big over the top bombastic speech and then like his his hand motions and he goes and he and he points at her and and she has a startled reaction she's um because here's this guy she doesn't know he's bigger than her he's acting like aggressive around now he's not trying to intimidate her but he is sort of intimidating in the sense that, like, yeah, well, he's... She doesn't know him. She's not comfortable around him. And it's a... Kind of a... Strange position for her to be in there. And... Um, where am I going with this? <laughs> I'm still a little... Uh, a little bit of a brain fog. It's, it's all just little subtle hints that we're not looking at something exactly as it happened because the way Cloud and Tifa would interact in this situation is different than the way we're seeing them interact in this flashback. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a lie going on in a few different forms here because it's not just Cloud's idea of 
what was going on back then that's distorted. It's Tifa's um, own mind that's distorting this as well. And I'm not sure to what level we are seeing this distortion because the original game definitely went and had a bit of a dissonance between the way Tifa thought of her childhood, their childhood, and even Tifa thought about the Nibelheim incident and what was, in fact, reality. Now, Tifa had... Tifa and Cloud did grow up together. They were neighbors. But they didn't know each other that well, at least not when they were very young. Tifa was one of the popular girls, and Cloud wasn't, but he had a crush on her, and he always wanted to get her attention, but she just dismissed him. She didn't think about him. Well, I don't think she disliked him or anything. She just didn't... He was outside of her um, recognition. He just wasn't somebody she thought about. Well, her mother dies at some point, and Tifa... I don't know how the mother dies. Perhaps she died off in the mountain somewhere. So Tifa decides that she's going to go out there and look for her. Look for her mother. And everyone's saying, like, no, 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 you can't go out there. But she's determined to go and do it. And Cloud has his crush on her, so he follows her out there. Well, something happens, and, like, uh, maybe uh, she slips or something, and she takes a tumble down a cliff. Cloud followed her and tried to save her. Didn't, though. And they both ended up falling down. Now, Cloud just got some bumps and bruises. Tifa went into a coma for a few days. So the whole town blamed Cloud for what had happened to her, thinking that he was the one that convinced her to go out there, even though that wasn't true. Which just led to Cloud being more of an outsider led to him being more of a pariah around town. <laughs> now everybody blamed Cloud, and perhaps even Cloud blamed himself for this. But the one person who didn't blame him was Tifa. She was the only one that knew what had actually happened. I guess she wasn't able to convince anybody else of the truth. And that sort of planted an idea in her head that Cloud was somebody more significant in her life. So she she ended up um, developing this kind of knight in shining armor fantasy. That some guy would come and save her if she were ever in trouble. And the object of her fantasy was Cloud. She wanted Cloud to be the guy to come and save her because he was the guy that tried to save her. Now she starts developing stronger emotions for him, but... She doesn't seem to have revealed them to him in any way that he could recognize. So as time went on, he maintained his feelings for her. She started developing feelings for him, but neither one of them um, perhaps knew it. Maybe Tifa did, but uh, maybe Tifa understood his feelings for her. But I'm not sure about that. So it leaves Cloud still trying to get her attention, even though he had already gotten it to declare that he was going to go join the military because he figures joining the military and becoming soldier. He is going to become a hero. He's going to be strong. He's going to be able to protect her. He's going to get her attention. This, of course, works. Just the claim that he was going to do it ended up getting her attention. And she makes that makes him make that bizarre promise that he's going to come and rescue her if she's ever in trouble. And then he disappears, and she basically doesn't see him again. It's not exactly true, but more or less, she doesn't see him again for the next seven years. So, in the years that followed, she allows this idea in her head that the, that he made this huge promise to her, that those that the two of them were strong friends and all that kind of stuff, to really just sort of build in her mind into the point where she has this completely distorted perspective of what their friendship, their relationship was like. She thinks that they were close childhood friends even though they weren't. The way he looks at it though is is wrong as well because he thinks that she was um, just ignoring him all the time and he had to fight to get her attention and in the beginning that was true but eventually yeah she he did have her attention. How did I get off onto this tangent? Um, 
Okay, so yeah, that's their both characters have a kind of distorted perspective of the past. Now, something that the, this game seems to be doing, and I'm not sure why. I'm assuming that they're gonna do, they're doing it on purpose, but they are playing off the idea that Tifa and Cloud were not close friends, and they're having they're having the two of them acknowledge it. So Barrett asked an episode ago, "Was like, oh, you two were neighbors?" And Tifa says, "Yeah, but we didn't hang out much." In the original game, she didn't know that. In the original game, she believed that the two of them were close friends. So that is a little bit of a um, a change that they have here. So I'm not sure. I'm I'm assuming right now. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, and I'm assuming that the developers were aware of this, and this wasn't just some little um, screw up. It's something that I had noticed. A lot of the people, like in the past few years, we've started to see this long form, like YouTube video format, where people talk about games, but like in these going more in depth into. The, to the storylines and all that kind of stuff. And for some reason, not everybody of course, but a lot of them, a lot of people seem to have missed that fact for some reason. That Tifa and Cloud were not close when they were kids. And they keep referring to like, oh yeah, they were they were childhood friends. They grew up together. Yeah. Yeah, but no. Now I, I some people, yeah, uh, have recognized this and have factored it into their analysis of the story, but most, for some reason, had missed it. I guess it's because the revelation of that doesn't come out until much later on in the game, and it's surrounded by the greater recognition of the Nibelheim incident being different than Cloud remembered. So I guess maybe it sort of gets lost in all of that revelation. But it does seem a little bit strange that it isn't a little bit more common knowledge that they both had distorted perspectives of this. Wait. Huh? What? Get back. This way. You said you wanted to be a hero. Wish I had. Good things were after Materia. The Materia Guardian. Of course, it was a monster called the Materia Keeper in the original game, but it wasn't fought during Nibelheim flashback. It was a boss as you're going through in the present day. So maybe we'll fight it again, or something like it. Not terribly out of place, considering this is geographically close to where it was in the original game. So, okay. Uh, I'm not sure the uh, how the character relationship between Cloud and Tifa is going to play out in this game. So I don't know if there's really much of a difference. There's going to be a big difference. But there is something to point out that both the characters seem to have not understood the uh, importance of... Not, not understood the nature of the relationship between the two of them. So Cloud was the one who had to point out to Tifa later on, said, no, we weren't friends, we weren't close, we weren't anything like that. And then it was because Tifa had thought that they were much closer than they actually were. Whereas T uh, Cloud was the one that later on was believing like, oh no, she doesn't pay any attention to me, she doesn't notice me, all this other kind of stuff, I gotta do all this other kind of thing to get her attention and that wasn't really the case because he had already gotten her attention by that point now i can understand that these were teenagers they were 13 i guess during the water tower flashback so they're both young they're both not particularly good at expressing their emotions and expressing their uh, expressing their 
desires and their common attraction or anything like that. So it kind of makes sense that the two of them would have this weird miscommunication where they both had crushes on each other, but they weren't able to communicate it, which would have solved both of them a lot of problems had they just been more straightforward about it. But <laughs> you see it definitely occur later on in the game because um, the it's obvious from, especially in the beginning of the game, but you're seeing it in, in the remake trilogy as well, that when Cloud comes back in Atifa's life all these years later, she still has these strong feelings for him, but she's not able to communicate it with him. And I, in the original game anyway, it seems to more or less be up to the player through dialogue choices to make the determination of whether Cloud still has feelings for Tifa. So that kind of throws a wrench into the gears of that. But it's obvious that Tifa still has these strong feelings for Cloud. And that complicates the relationship more, but it also is the reason why the door gets open for Aerith to step in. <laughs> You're practically panting. I'm excited. <laughs> Such a puppy. So Cloud has these romantic intentions and he wants to get Tifa's attention and he wants to be with Tifa, but since the two of them can't communicate these mutual feelings to each other, it leads to a lot of misunderstanding. And that is where Aerith comes in. Now Aerith is much more aggressive, aggressive in her pursuit of Cloud. She's more flirtatious. She has no trouble whatsoever uh, demonstrating her affection for him. And she essentially just becomes... She made it much easier for Cloud because he never had to guess her intentions. He never had to... Like, whatever Cloud did, he, to, did, he did to get Tifa's attention. And she sort of was coy about it, her interest on him. Now, from her perspective, she was probably like standing in front of him shouting with a megaphone, but something that uh, a lot of women don't seem to understand is guys are not quite as capable of picking up the sort of subtleties of body language or things like that. So Tifa probably thought that she was being rather overt. Cloud wasn't picking up on it. Aerith, on the other hand, left no question as to what she was doing. Left no question what her attention was or her uh, interest in Cloud which made it so much easier for him that he drifted towards Era. Of course, that was dependent on player choice in the original game. Take it from here. work. <laughs> okay, hold up. Maybe I'm missing something here, but everything you've said makes Sephiroth sound like a stand-up guy. Well, he was. And now he's pure evil, trying to kill everyone on the planet. Help me to understand this shit. Tell me something that'll really make my blood boil. Oh, I will. I will. <laughs> 